Welcome to the Scaling Creative Podcast. Excited to be here. We've got a new little setup that we got going on here today. Our topic is all about leadership and building culture as you're growing an organization. And we do have a guest in the house, in the Scaling Creative yeah. house. Oh, so welcome, Joe, Joe Hensler. I'm going to hand it over. Glad to be here, for sure. Yeah. So first, introduce yourself, and then I want to talk about why we have you on. Just kind of give people in 30 seconds your life story. I'm just <laughs> That's about all it will take. <laughs> so just Perfect. a Jersey guy who started to love leading in a church and using my gifts to bring hope and encouragement to people and then having the opportunity to, I guess, see a church grow and learn how to lead in a changing, growing environment. So really love people and love leadership. That's it's awesome. Kind of the That's short awesome. form. Mm -hmm. and, you're like, perfect. and you're like a natural entrepreneurial heart guy too. Like I know what, that's what I've always appreciated about you is just that you also are like, you have this such a different mindset than like most pastors per se that I've always admired. Just like we, the amount of times that we talk about like spiritual things, but then we'll randomly talk about business is super cool, which is why I wanted to have you on the podcast because obviously you're the lead pastor of a church, meaning you pastor a lot of people and staff, but you also are very good at like the balance of building a culture that is healthy while also realizing that it's difficult to grow teams. And so I think it's cool because you can, I think, bring a lot of insight that even though you pass their church, a lot of your principles and the way that you do things are just really good for businesses. And that's kind of why I wanted to have yeah. you on the Yeah, I mean, podcast. it's interesting. I, I never thought when I was a kid I'd grow up to be a pastor. My dad's yeah. a really great businessman, and he trained me to be a businessman, and I always thought I'd be running a business and then somewhere in journeys, like for all of us, it doesn't go where we think it's going to go. And I just, you know, I think God had a different plan for me. And so a lot of what I learned about business and leadership came from a father who was a really good business leader and kind of picked that up along the way and never thought I could use that in the church. But mm -hmm. actually it's God's design and been able to use it. So it's been fun. Yeah. But my first question for you was actually going to be, if you had a leader, like if you could look back kind of in the beginning of your leadership, if you had somebody, whether it was a mentor or somebody you really admired that you kind of modeled yourself after, would it be your dad or would it be someone else? Well, I mean, in, in, in two ways, I mean, I would point to two fathers. So okay. My dad, my physical father, was somebody who's a great entrepreneur and even he, he used to run mortgage departments, but the okay. people under his leadership, he'd had a lot of people he led in a banking environment. Okay. And yet he was the guy that knew their families, visited them in the hospitals, cared a lot about them, even though in a lot of ways it's like, he, 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 he wanted them to do their work and sell mo money, mortgages, but he cared so much about them as individuals. They wound up loving and serving him and like pushing the envelope in what they were selling because he took such good care of them. So I think he demonstrated to me building a good culture, even though he was getting results, he cared about people. So at his retirement dinner, it was fascinating to see how many people showed up and talked about how this business guy cared about their families. Yeah. He, they didn't talk about how much money they all made. It was about he cared. So he was one, you know, obviously my physical father, but my spiritual father, a guy who mentored me, okay. same kind of person, just cared a ton about people. And because he cared about people and built, built a church environment where he showed people he loved them and cared about them, but still had high expectations. He showed me a little bit of that in the church world. And so that's kind of how I thought, maybe I could bring some of this entrepreneurial mm -hmm. leadership into a church environment, Yeah. still care and have a high value for caring for people, but build systems that can move the ball down the court in the kingdom, maybe further than other churches mm -hmm. I've been involved in yeah. have. Yeah, I think that's the hardest part as as a leader and what I think that you always did so well in my opinion is that you're really good at balancing something has to get done and in certain times there's not a debate about it but you did it with love and then other times it was like you'd come in randomly because I want to preface this first that like the only real full-time job I had over the last 15 years was at the church and under your leadership <laughs> so obviously part of why I loved it there was that the culture was good and there were times that you, there were times that I would know what you were telling me was 
honest. I needed to hear it, the things I needed to work on. There are other times you just randomly come in the office just so that you can be a normal person and be like, hey, how's it going? And you're really good at the balance, I think, of not ever feeling like you're demanding or running over people while simultaneously saying this needs to get done. And that's not necessarily up for debate, mm-hmm. but that's really hard to do. Because yeah. I, know, I know that that's absolutely something I struggle with of how you, how you build a culture of getting things done excellently, but also letting go of certain things is really tricky. For sure. I mean, and ultimately what it comes down to for me is I really love people and I mm-hmm. care about people and I really love getting a lot of things done. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like I have very high expectations. I wouldn't hold anybody under my leadership to a higher expectation than I hold myself. But I also care a lot about people. And so it's like, hey, I love you. I care about you. But this needs to be said. And no, what you're doing isn't acceptable. I'm just going to do that with respect when I say it. I'm going to do it. And you're going to feel it. Like, you're going to know. I mean, mm-hmm. You've been on the yeah, other yeah, side yeah. of this. Like, you know I'm serious. Like, I, hey. Right. But I'm the first one to have fun. I'm the first one to show you I care about you. And I'm the first one to say, hey, no, that's not going to fly. Mm-hmm in this culture. And yeah, I think that starts to come out in your leadership, in your organization. If you value something as an individual, your, your company, your church, your family is going to represent what you value. Mm -hmm. If you value something, it comes out. If you don't, can't Mm -hmm. pretend. So I think for me, that's been like, I really love you as a person, Mm -hmm. sincere, but I also have high expectations and I have a vision of where I know we need to go as a church and nothing's going to stop that from getting done. I remember one time I walked in your your office or early on in in when I worked there that and you said that one of the things that you always told people is that if you ever come in and use the I think the exact term was like permission to speak freely mm-hmm. that the idea that if I come in and say that first you can't respond and you're just gonna like listen to it and yep. it's the idea of almost like putting on because I know like Pablo and I have this situation too where it's sometimes hard because like we were friends first. Yeah. And there's there's like a boss hat, a friend hat, mm-hmm. a worship leader friend hat. There's so many different hats. And the problem is it's sometimes hard to know what hat you're wearing. Yep. And so sometimes we literally have to have conversations of like, okay, for a second, disregard that we're friends, disregard that we're anything. Like not trying to be mean, but yep. the boss is speaking in this situation. And that's hard. And that was kind of something I, I still remember, the idea that you're kind of like setting up the tough conversations in advance of like, yep. this might not be which one here. Nope. But and, and, sometimes and, it has to know, be said. Again, if you model that to your right. employees, so every person we onboard onto our staff, I tell them that. Like, you can always come into my office and say, permission to speak freely, sir. And I'll know that means we're not talking on a hierarchy. Everybody's on a level playing field. And mm-hmm. I need to hear something that you've got to say, and I will sit back and listen. It's what in the it's a military term, mm-hmm. but if you as a to know wherever ever you are, you could go to a sergeant or a general and say, permission to speak freely, sir. Mm. And they would know, okay, I, I need to hear something from you. So if I model that in my leadership, then I give people permission to do that, but then they should expect I'm also going to walk in and say, hey, right. we need right. to have and a conversation have to still, about something. And it means nothing if you don't have the humility to actually listen to it, right? Yep. It's like, Did I you think, ever do it? Did you ever come in and say permission to speak I don't, freely, should, sir? I don't think I think we naturally had a good relationship that <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like we talked enough in general that I never felt like I even had to say it per se. Yeah. But that's... Uh, kudos to your leadership because obviously you know I'm a unique person to have to to have you work for. I'm not always easy. No, um, you're a thir- you know I mean for me I want I want a team full of thoroughbreds mm-hmm. that I have to hold back, not jackasses. I have to mm-hmm. kick. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean that's a high value to me. And right. when you are on our team, you're a thoroughbred, and every thoroughbred has thoroughbred problems. And the thoroughbred problem is I got to hold you back sometimes, and I right. have to mm-hmm. pull you this way or pull you mm-hmm. that way. I would much rather have a thoroughbred problem mm-hmm. where I'm trying to hold people back than jackasses I have right. to kick and go, get going. Yeah. Right. So any leader is going to have a problem with that. But, you you know, you have demonstrated yourself time and time again in my interactions with you is you're just a great thoroughbred. And so with that, there's going to be, mm-hmm. okay, any thoroughbred sometimes doesn't like wearing a saddle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so true. It's like, but you know what? The saddle is what trains you to be yeah. able to run in directions and win. So, you know, I don't know. So a couple of things I heard just from what we've been saying so far is that like you can't lead people if you don't love people. Like that's like one thing I definitely 
keep hearing as a theme for sure. Um, and then the other one is that everything that you preach, you practice. So you have to lead by example, you know, so that's, that's pretty cool. Those are just some of the main things. Anybody hear anything that like really stuck out to you so far yet? What Joe said? I, I, well, I've, I've always found it interesting that I think, you know, I, I've seen it, I've heard it said that there's a difference between being the good guy and the nice guy. And I feel like when you're constantly the nice guy, you're not helping anybody because you're just constantly being okay with everything, push over, letting things happen. But when you're in a leadership position, there has to be a balance of you have to be the nice guy because if you're not nice, <laughs> right. nobody's going to you know, yeah. want to even work with you. But if you're the good guy and you come in with that loving, a loving mentality but also just like a, a, a directional voice for somebody or just explaining like this is what I'm seeing that you might not be seeing because sometimes it's very hard to see yourself when you're you're yeah. in the frame you yep. know yep. but if there's somebody that cares about you that's a leader mm -hmm. and they bring something to you it's because they care about you if they didn't they wouldn't say anything right um, so I've just always found it interesting that it's a very e even balance and also when you're a leader as well another thing that I've noticed too is that you have to see good and bad in people you can't just be one or the other. I've noticed, you know, sometimes there's people that only see the good and then that's like... That was me for so many years. Which is, <laughs> which is fine, which yeah. is fine. But I'm learning as I'm, just as I've gotten like, in the past couple of years, I've noticed that you're like... you're getting old. You're getting so old. That's it. <laughs> that's it. Now that you've reached your mid-20s. Yeah. Ooh. I have a puppy now. You're, you're so, a quarter you know. of the way yeah. there. Next level. Yeah. You are next you're level. Mid, you're mid-20s. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I, and I don't claim like I know no. everything, but I'm learning. I'm learning. Oh, go, go. You're yeah. right. But no, but it's, it's, I think there's like a, a level of maturity that if a leader can see good and bad in people. Yeah. Like, I feel like if it's, if it's all good, then there's, that's weird almost. And if it's all bad, then it's like, what are you, are you that negative? Like, you know, there should be a, a level of both. And from kind of that conversation you just had, I, I can see that you're approaching everybody with what's good, what's bad, and what can we work on, mm -hmm. on both sides of that. And I think it's not even necessarily always just like good and bad too. It's understanding that's that we all have weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And as a leader, that's probably been the toughest thing is realizing that you have as many weaknesses as somebody else. Their weaknesses are just different. Mm -hmm. And trying to balance everyone's weakness uniquely and not just say, that's a weakness, we need to improve that. It's like, if that's a, it could be a weakness that's not going to improve to a point. And I, since I'm such a big fan of like, go all in on your strengths and don't improve your weaknesses per se, you kind of have to, you kinda have to fight totally that balance. I agree with that, but yeah. Yeah, but, it, <laughs> and, and, and I think that, a lot of people wouldn't. I just think that yeah. personally, it's, I just think it's personally a waste of time to yeah. to improve things. With someone, uh, a wise person that I consider some mentor said to me, like wishful thinking gets you killed. Meaning, mm -hmm. you can think all you want and hope all you want for something <laughs> to happen, but if it's just not going to happen mm -hmm. in a certain person, a certain personality, mm -hmm. a certain skill set, it probably makes more sense to just go harder on what they're good at. Rather than and, and I mean, and maybe we need to turn the conversation to a little bit. I, you know, the the negative and positive thing is just it, it's actually. I, I think personally, I think that's a false dichotomy. Meaning, mm. if you actually look at it from a film thing, like if you have a positive, mm -hmm. you have to have a negative. Mm -hmm. There's no positive without the negative. So, like if you actually took a photo, mm -hmm. you can't get rid of the negative. Right. Because the negative is actually what produces the positive. So maybe turning the conversation to, okay, I have strengths, and how do I steward the shadow of my strength? Mm. No, knowing that I'm not going to change some of those things. I can't. Like, Joe's got a really big, loud personality. There's a shadow to that. But if I try to get rid of the shadow, I lose the big Joe personality. That's just who I am. Mm -hmm. right. But I've had to learn how in certain situations to steward the shadow of me, which mm -hmm. is, hey, maybe you need to come into the room and shut up and just listen. You don't need to talk all the time. You don't mm -hmm. need to dominate. But when I do talk, I tend to be like I'm talking yeah. and I'm my hands are moving yeah. and I'm <laughs> loud and yeah. laughter and fun. It's more, I'm going to steward the fact that I don't have to do that all the time mm -hmm. and in every situation. So what are the shadows of our strengths mm -hmm. and how do we steward those shadows? If I'm trying to get something done and you're in my way, the shadow is, okay, I don't want to bulldoze you, but I need to let you know you're in my way and mm -hmm. do that in a kind, kind way because I'm driven. 
Yeah. So how do I steward that? I don't know. How did you discover that? Like, did, was that just over time that you kind of learned how to do when that? I got into my mid twenties as I was growing up. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you hit that twenty. Now I can relate. Now I, can relate <laughs> yeah, I think I think you're you know I think all of us we're just trying to figure this out. And mm -hmm. We're seeing successes in certain areas of our lives and learning the successes and trying to okay, I got all these weaknesses. And then you try, like Scott said earlier, like you try to get rid of those weaknesses mm -hmm. and you waste a heck of a lot of time from sometimes going, why am I, I'm not organized. I'm not organized. Yeah. I'm not organized. Like, well, I, no matter how hard I try, I'm not sure I'll ever be organized. Mm -hmm. So how do I steward the parts of me that are good? And I just mm -hmm. think by trial and error and experience mm -hmm. and rubbing shoulders with other leaders, yeah. asking questions, learning. My mentors have been a huge, have mm -hmm. a huge voice in my life to teach me these things. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think just, just, I'm the old guy in the circle. I'm 43. Mm -hmm. So I'm just you're ahead of you. You're, you're young. No, I think that's a really good point. And I, and I think nowadays comparison really is just a difficult thing because you, you have access to seeing a lot of people or what you think is seeing other people. And so you're constantly comparing like, oh, I wish I was more organized or I wish I was more like her or, you know, but God made us each very unique, like on purpose. We're one body. We all have different gifts and strengths. And so I love, I just love the analogy of the shadow of like stewarding the shadow of your strength. That's so good. And something I want, so going from that, what I kind of, would love to dive into is I know obviously one of the most important aspects of leadership is understanding like each person uniquely and mm. understanding what drives them, what doesn't, all those things. So taking the next step of, you know, you, you're, the organization that you lead is obviously much larger than it used to be. How do leaders go about adapting to the reality that you no longer have your hands in everything? Because I think it's easy to a point, even though I still mess up with this, it's easy to a point when you have you know four or five people to know everyone personally, know every situation, know everything they're going through, all that kind of stuff. It can be easier, but when you start to grow an organization and you no longer are a part of it or a part of everything, like we used to laugh at because when I first came on staff there about five years ago, it's so different than it is now. And I remember having a conversation with the whole team of like, there's been a lot of things that happen at the church that I have no clue are even happening anymore. Mm -hmm. How do you still build the same culture when you no longer touch everything? Yeah. Or know everybody. Like, you know everybody, but you don't know everybody as good. <laughs> I mean, we have name tags on our staff because I need to know everybody's name. I mean, it's just reality. So for other reasons, but you know, that helps. <laughs> so uh, there's a guy in California who's a leadership coach. He's also a pastor, but he's a great leadership coach and author. His name is Larry Osborne. And I think he uses the best scaling analogy that helped me so much. He says, as your organization grows, it moves from like thinking of a sports analogy, it moves from different size teams. So you go from being a golf buddies and a golf team to then a basketball team, to then a football team. And then a football team, like a high school football team, is very different than a college football team, which is very different than an NFL team. And understanding, okay, I've been on church staffs that have been more like golf buddies, where there's three or four of us, and we really know each other super well. We laugh together. We play together. We know each other's games and know each other's idiosyncrasies. And we're working our way through the 18 holes sort of of business and life like we're golf buddies. And then when it switches and you're no longer just four of you, but now you're like a basketball team and there's a bunch of you and then you're a basketball team that has an offensive coordinator and a defensive coordinator, right. but everybody on the basketball team and a basketball team coaching staff needs to know defense and offense and be able to know all the plays because the team is still small enough that it's like, okay, we might have a defensive specialist and an offensive specialist, but everybody on the court has to be able to play defense and offense. Well, the cosmic shift to football team, where now you have people that are just defensive specialists yeah. and offensive specialists, and the offense has no idea and doesn't even care what the defense is doing. Yeah, they're, they're sitting on the bench when you watch my like, TV. Yeah, the defense is like, happening. when the defense is there, they know what they're supposed to do and they have a job. 
and they've got to do their job as successfully as possible. And the offense just cares, when are we supposed to go out? Great, we go out. And the, mm -hmm. you think about the scale and the change of co coaching and playing and what that's like. So for us as a church, we've gone through that on our leadership team where it's like, okay, it's really different now when there's three or four pastors mm -hmm. you, and then staff, what that's like and the feel and camaraderie and fun of what that feels like compared to, oh, we just moved to a basketball team and we have a couple coaches and everybody knows everything, but you still are a specialist, to now we're a football team. And right. it's like the offense doesn't have any idea what the defense is doing, but the offense has to trust that the defense is doing their job. And, and as the coach, so to speak, of the whole thing, I have to empower my coaches and players yeah. and put the right people in the right place and then back up and let them go. But that's hard. And the biggest change is inside me. It's a change inside me that I have to be able to adjust to the fact that I like the golf buddy mm. feel. Mm. I like the yeah. everybody knows the offense and the defense feel. It's hard when I don't know and I have to give up knowledge and relationship, connectivity. That's hard personally for me. So I've had to work through that and go for the sake of winning the Super Bowl. Yeah. yeah. It's... We're not just changing teams to change teams. We're changing it because we have a vision and a goal to accomplish something. And when that happens, it's worth it to me. Yeah. Some leaders go, it's not worth it. I want to be a golf team. And that's okay. Great. Right. right. Be a golf team. I think, yeah, we just had a conversation, Pablo and I just the other day, actually, about how, like, even different it is from the time that there were two of us to even four or five, that sometimes I think it's easy to get in this mentality that you should just – never stop growing. And, you know, someone makes a good pasta salad and someone's like, you should start a business doing pasta. Maybe they don't want to start a business. Right. <laughs> and like, but I think that that can be hard because in a comparison world or even just in natural, like if things go well and you start to have any success, do you ever draw the line? Like if you love the golf buddy or you like the basketball team, how do you even stay there if you actually want to? Because if you're doing things well, how do you not grow but that can be tough because I think some people don't like the football team at all. Well, and the, and and see the unique this this the, there's a unique leader that can jump and scale from those mm -hmm. different spots. You know, you, you, on one level, you hit a ceiling of a built leadership ability to being able to scale and being able to. So you have to know yourself mm -hmm. and be able to feel the ceiling before someone tells you you hit the ceiling. Mm -hmm. If someone has to tell you you hit the ceiling, then you need to probably stay as a golf team. Like you hit it and you're frustrated and you're struggling. If somebody else yeah, says yeah, that, you. Yeah. so if you're aware enough and you certain personalities scale and certain leaderships don't, and it's not, it's so easy to go bigger is better. Right. No. Right. right. Like the best football coaches that are happening in high school levels are happy to be incredible football coaches. Mm -hmm. If yeah. they go to the next level, they may not be successful. Right. Why? Be content with right. what you have. Mm -hmm. So there's just a guy like the like Eagles coach, right? A couple of years ago, kind of feel like Chip Kelly. Chip Kelly yeah. He is an Great example of an incre yeah. incredible college, college. coach. Yep. When he scaled up to NFL, it wasn't his deal. Okay, go be a killer college coach. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Now, can you scale to a football team if you're not that mentality, but you put more people around you? are what do you think of that like what do you think of because obviously the other way to scale leadership is to put more and more good leaders around you right and, and pull away from the things that you're absolutely so i mean i think on one level if you can't see it mm -hmm. and don't understand it it doesn't matter how many good people you surround yourself with but if you know it and see like right now in my leadership i feel like i've hit my ceiling like mm -hmm. I've, I'm up against the ceiling. And what that's doing is nobody came and told me that. I feel it. I sense mm -hmm. it. And now I'm working outside of my normal rhythms to figure out and learn and get the coaching and the help. Mm -hmm. But nobody, like my board didn't come and say, Joe, you hit your ceiling. I know intrinsically mm -hmm. there's things that we're doing now and ways that we're leading and serving that is beyond my abilities, the, mm -hmm. anything I've ever experienced before. And so it pushes me outside of myself to get the help and coaching I need to be able to learn and then lead people and surround myself with good people. So if, 
if you're the only one in the org that doesn't see it and everybody else does and you're right. surrounded by thoroughbreds, they'll run you over, right? right? And I don't, so you have to be able to perceive it and see it and get the coaching necessary to, to break through that ceiling. That's or, so important because you have a willingness to say, okay, I'm at my limit, so I'm going to get the help that I need. I'm going to get a coach. I'm going to learn. I'm going to figure this out. And I don't think that you can scale if you're not willing to learn and grow and say, okay, I need a little bit of help. I need some assistance in this. So if you're going to be a leader and you want to have a culture, you, I think you have to be a learner. Preach, girl, preach. <laughs> Seriously. And then you also had the, I think the hardest part too is like deciding what you need help in. Yeah. Because sometimes too, you can also just hire and hire and be like, well, more people will help this whole thing. But it's like, right. not if you hire all the same people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you need to figure out what things, because mm -hmm. when you start and you do everything, you naturally don't necessarily know what actually is your mm -hmm. actual skill set. Because mm -hmm. you're kind of like, well, I did everything. And then you start to go and you're like, okay, do I like this anymore? Okay, should I hire that? It, yeah. That becomes tough too, right? Trying to figure out what's the next, when you're going from two employees to three employees, that's 33% yeah. of the people are the load trying to figure out what's the next most important. Yeah. Is five to 10 employees is a small jump. But then like once you start to get to huge scale, each person plays to a point a smaller role than like when there's only three people or four mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. do, you do you find that well, that is I th different? I think, yeah, you, 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 you move from generalists to specialists. Mm, so cool. it's like, okay. That's what Apple calls them too. You know, you just, you see this play out. Okay, when you're smaller, you have to be able to have your hands in lots of things and yeah. be able to multitask and be able to be successful in multiple things. As you scale, you wind up hiring more specialists. And then you you get, as the, I think as an organization grows, it goes generalist to specialist. And then if it keeps growing, then everyone becomes generalists again because you're expanding mm. and you have to, Okay, then you it's like this generalist specialist, generalist specialist, and this mm. is ebb and flow back and forth and back and forth. If you're not doing that, that means you're just hiring like crazy and you're probably going to kill your culture. Is going you're going to lose your culture. But it's like, okay, we're going to bring people on slowly. They're going to be generalists. New people a lot of times are generalists until you get you you want to give your specialists the best and I don't know. I think the best opportunities. Yeah. And that usually means, especially in a smaller environment, people that have earned the cred with you, that you trust them enough to say, I will let you and I want you to be a specialist in this area. Mm -hmm. Let me hire some more generalists. You, right. I know you well enough, you be a specialist. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting flow of trusting people and yeah. learning what they're good at. I think that that's a hard part for people is... It's not hard for you. Letting... Oh, it's hard for me, for sure. <laughs> is letting... Because, because here's, here's what also I think happens that, you know, I think every leader sees is you give some things away and people drop the ball in certain aspects. How do you fight the balance of not in a three-strike-you're-out mentality... Mm -hmm. Like that's hard for me. One strike and you're out of my my world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. No, but I think that that's a, the biggest thing that's hard of letting go of things is when you let go, give full trust, and internally you're like, man, that's not at all yeah. the way. Like and, that's and hard. It's really hard. And I I think this is where hiring is a huge like the whole adage of hire slow, fire fast. Mm -hmm. No matter what size organization you're in, that is a principle that just transcends anything. Hire slow, make sure you know these individuals and you're bringing on people that share your values and your work ethic and are coachable. And if and when it seems like it's not working, don't waste time saying you're not a right fit. Be clear, be caring, but at the end of the day, you could waste so much time 
if somebody isn't the right fit, you just sucks your energy out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You like, I don't want to be like one strike, you're out. But it's there is certain things you, where you trust, sometimes you, and you see it. You don't have a choice. You're trying to, you know, a company. You're trying to make a profit. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and you're trusting large things. If if I come and say that I need you to do this, and you drop the ball significantly multiple times, you're probably not going to change. Hey, I'm sorry, this isn't going to work. Right. I don't. I, I don't have time to coach some basic. Yeah things mm -hmm. so but i want to just circle back to something else like i can't hire coachable people which i think is a huge part of scaling finding coachable people mm -hmm. if i'm not coachable mm -hmm. totally so yeah. if i don't lead with a coachable spirit mm -hmm. then the people i hire aren't going to be coachable right. either mm -hmm. and the worst part about having an employee is if they're not coachable and it's like oh gosh what about people who they think that they're coachable, but they're not actually coachable. <laughs> like, have you ever dealt with that? Like well, people who think me, it's a let strength? Let me do a little storytelling of Scott McKenna. I mean, before I hired Scott on our team, I mean, I think this is fair to say. And one level, I don't we know took what you're going to say, so I can't say it. We, <laughs> like when we, we, to some degree, we took a little bit of a risk mm -hmm. on you. Yeah. And it was like, okay, the Scott that all of us see now is not the Scott of five or seven years ago when I first met you. A mm -hmm. lot of the same raw material, obviously, but mm -hmm. raw. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was like, okay, we were thinking about hiring him and we were thinking about hiring him to do music and video. Mm -hmm. It was like a combined position because we didn't have the money to have a specialist. Mm -hmm. We needed a generalist. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, maybe this, this kid could do worship and do video. Mm -hmm. And so I remember giving you a project and saying, before I hire you, here's a project. Mm -hmm. And I was watching to see how coachable he was going to be mm. in this project if in the hiring process you're not coachable mm. you're not going to be coachable right. in the in the like we always put our best foot front forward yeah. when we're being hired so if in the hiring process you're not coachable then you're heck of when i put you in a seat and you start getting a paycheck you're not going to change yeah. yeah and i remember you know like before we hired scott there were things i said and did with him mm. to see if how he was going to respond when I said, I don't like how you led that song. I, you know what? He gave me a draft of a video project and it was like, I want you to change this and I want you to change that. And honestly, I don't know if I really cared that the thing was changed. I wanted to see right. how he was going to respond to me when I said, change this. Because if he was going to give me an attitude and go, no, I like it. It's the way. I, no. And, and my experience with you was that everything I tried to coach, you were receptive you gave me a positive attitude you were willing to hear and even if you didn't agree with me you did what i expected because in that moment it's like i was the supervisor right. and you mm -hmm. were the employee so to speak yeah. so and i think for you you were coachable and you you want that and exhibit that as you want that and exhibit it it helps to model that for your your staff and team so i don't know I'm trying to raise kids that are coachable, and that's interesting. I have three teenage sons. Yeah. How's that trying going? to coach. I'm, it's a full <laughs> core press, right? Yeah. yeah. Three teenage boys. Yeah. Isn't that fun? Your poor wife. She's got She's four only. teenage boys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the biggest <laughs> one. Is it different? Like, okay, when you think about parenting and being a leader, do you feel like they're vastly different or a lot of core similarities well I, you know so totally sidebar but i i think i'm enough of a leader and i love leadership so much mm -hmm. and i think that leadership is missing in our world yes you know i used to say the only thing the world is missing is jesus now i say the only thing the world is missing is jesus and leaders mm. and effective and, leadership <laughs> so it's like I, I i decided maybe eight years ago with our mm -hmm. with i have three sons with the three sons that i wasn't just ladies raising young men who i want them to love jesus I was raising leaders. Mm. And so we just decided to combine all that into one thing. And it's Love like that. parenting is about raising leaders. Mm -hmm. I want them and they're all different, yep. but I really want them and they're all in their own personality mm. to grow up to be men who know how to lead in whatever environment and personality. So we have a lot of leadership conversations around That's our dinner so table. so good. Which is super fun. Yeah. yeah. What do you think okay. is the most common thing you see when you think of bad leadership, you've obviously been around lots of different people. You 
been around lots of different leaders. You still follow some. You probably don't follow others. <laughs> what what kind of do you see a thread of? If you could pinpoint, if someone said the biggest thing you see, I mean the the probably quick thought is I think a lot of leaders are bullies. Mm. Mm. There's a lot of times that people think leadership is power, mm -hmm. and so the the kinds of leaders that I don't want to be around and I don't have any respect for and I don't care what truth they push out of their mouths, whether it's biblical truth, leadership truth, whatever, psychological. If you're a bully, mm -hmm. if you're mean and you abuse power, I have no time for you because I don't think leadership is ever about power and mm -hmm. authority. Yeah. I think people have the wrong definition of leadership. I think they think it's a title and it's something that you like are given when I feel like leadership is something that's earned and you, you know, over time, it takes time. I think and you have something that you have to like get from people rather than like something that's, I feel like, I don't know. I just feel like some people really attach it to a title like yep. you're saying. And I think that's just like the wrong definition of it, you know, for most people anyway. Bullying anybody, you know, using your influence and power to make people feel small, throwing your weight around in a company, doesn't matter what size, never yields good results. Mm -hmm. You know, servants, people that are humble, I want you to follow me. I can't mm -hmm. force you to follow me. Yeah. And even in a corporate yeah. setting, just because I wave money in front of you or I have the power to hire you and fire you, does that make you a leader? Right. No. The most successful, capable people that are generating the most income in the world are not throwing around their power and authority and wielding right. over people a paycheck. They're capturing people with vision and character and values. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they are inspiring people to follow. So I think that's also probably, I mean, the biggest culture killer is when you have a unbelievably skilled employee that nobody likes and you keep them on board because they're skills. And I think the ultimate sign of like, whether you actually care about your culture is whether you'd fire your best person in the entire company mm -hmm. that people hate. Right. Because that's also what I feel like I see happen in bigger companies is like, there's the guy, you know, John, I'm just saying, John, you know, John is this unbelievable sales guy, this unbelievable employee. He's top numbers in everything, but people can't stand him. Do you have the, the balls to fire that person because they're killing your culture, mm -hmm. even though it means you're going to short term lose money? Yep. Yeah. Well, and I th there's a piece of this whole idea of leadership where, you know, one of my roles and for you and your your role too, it, I'm the chief culture officer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we have 75 employees. There's a lot of things I don't do. But the one thing I do do with every employee is make it very clear I'm the chief culture officer and if I smell something in our culture that doesn't align with who we are, you got to know I'm going to tackle you mm -hmm. in the kindest, loving way. But I, it, <laughs> it's like, what does a it, kind tackle look like? Well, you've experienced it before. It's, it's usually like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know that I'm serious. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know that I love you and I care about you, but yeah. you know that I'm going to tell you like it is. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. So I've had experiences where one of our values is that we treat people with grace and truth, it's one of our core values. How do we treat every, and I had a situation where I heard a number of times an employee in conversations just being harsh. Yeah. Just the tone of their voice harsh and I'm walking through the hallways. They have no idea that I'm the chief culture officer and mm -hmm. my antennas are up to those core values. Mm -hmm. And so three months of just a number of examples of just a tone, mm -hmm. a harshness to how they were talking that I pulled them into my office one day and said, hey, what's going on? And they're like, why? Well, you know, I said, you know, I've noticed the tone of your voice is harsh. What's going on? Mm -hmm. And in the onboarding process, I've told all my employees that this is what I do, so this isn't a surprise right. to them. Yeah. It's like, this is what I do. And I said to them, you know, you're harsh. What's going on? And they broke down in tears and told me something that was going on at home. Yeah. And I had the opportunity to coach them through that. Yeah. But 
still doesn't mean they're allowed to be harsh. There's right. something beyond, behind that. Right. And if they were just like, well, no, that's just who I am, I'd be like, well, that's where you're going. Yeah, like, yeah. You, you, we can't do this. That's yeah. not how we treat people because my antennas have to be up to our mm -hmm. culture and protect it vigorously. So, yeah, the guy in our culture that might hit it out of the park in all kinds of ways, but he's a jerk. Sorry, yeah. dude, you're yeah. out. Yep. Yeah. I don't care how good you produce. Yep. And as a leader, knowing your core values of your company are incredibly important. And even to, I think sometimes people who are harsh or something's going on or something's off, a lot of times it's something that, that they're really struggling with. And I, as a leader, if you can speak into that and help them through that and they're coachable, like that's great. But sometimes they're not. I, I think you can't teach people to be hungry and you can't teach people to be humble. And so... Like if, if some of those things are part of your core value and you can't teach those things, like, yeah, they're out. And what do you, hard as a leader. And I know uh, another thing too is like, what do you think of uh, like the importance of accountability mm. at the top? Because, you know, in a church setting, there's elders and there's board and all that kind of stuff. That's a common thing. But I don't know if a lot of companies have that. Like how, how important do you feel like it is like the the top top person can obviously also be in a very you know I admit like a very lonely position yeah because to a point nobody can actually understand what you go through on a regular basis for many reasons so same way that I can't understand exactly what someone else goes through they can never understand fully what I go through how how important is accountability and yeah, I guess just accountability yeah. on, on the top. I mean, I think, again, it goes back to if you're a leader that's coachable, even if you don't have a boss, so to speak, so, you know, at certain sizes, obviously you're not going to have a board of directors. Right. Right? So, okay, yeah, I have a board. I report to a board, and they're my boss. But, you know, as a leader, I've always been hungry for accountability, if I value accountability, even at a level where I don't have accountability, I'm going to find a way to be accountable, whether that's creating an outside advisory team. You know, good things happen best in collaboration. And any sole entrepreneur that doesn't bounce ideas, look for ways to find accountability and share, because if you just do it on your own and you're the sole PowerPoint, Power goes to your head, and it yeah. could limp. That could be your your ceiling because you're not getting other advice. So I think if you have a hunger for accountability, that's a good thing. If you want your employees to be accountable, that's a good thing. In my setting, I was the first pastor to ever in my interviewing for the position. I asked for accountability. I said I will be reviewed once a year. No other pastor before me had ever gone through reviews, but that's in my DNA mm. to want that. And so I was the first pastor to ever have a review. I can't ask my employees to have a review and annually if I'm not leading by example. Yeah. So, okay, at a smaller level, what would be a way for an entrepreneur like you to get an advisory team? to say I'm bouncing ideas, I have three or four people, when I get to major crossroads, I'm gonna build an advisory team mm -hmm. that I'm gonna submit myself to, to demonstrate even that none of us do this well without accountability. Mm -hmm. But you have to want that. Yeah, it's, I think accountability is another aspect, another side to coachability. Mm -hmm. So accountability, would you agree, is something that you have to go get, it's not gonna find you? <laughs> I don't know, it depends on where you work. I mean, I'm sure if you work in big corporate, you're going to have accountability. Yeah, yeah no, but if you're you like don't the want head it, guy. Yeah, I think it becomes like realizing your own limitations and knowing that I make really good decisions, but I'm not perfect. I don't make perfect decisions. So how do I ensure high-quality, collaborative, wise decision-making at the top? If I don't humbly seek it, I'm not going to find it. What do you feel like? Do you feel like you have accountability right now? I mean, I feel like... And maybe behind closed doors, some people would say other things. I feel like, <laughs> I, I do feel like <laughs> I, when I get to crossroads and things, mm -hmm. I love bouncing ideas by people mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it's impossible for you to sometimes make the decisions. Mm -hmm. So, and I try to bounce ideas by certain people that I feel like are skilled in those things. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
I, I think it's incredibly important, and I and I do think that I truly do value that. I think mm-hmm. there obviously are, are times that I don't do well. Um, and you've, I mean, like I know that Scott's come to me and yeah. asked for advice and perspective, mm-hmm. and that's, you know, not in a spiritual way, but in a leadership right. way about mm-hmm. how do I handle this situation. Mm-hmm. But I also think that if, if you're going to scale and you're going to grow beyond one or five the bigger the scale, the more need for accountability yeah. mm-hmm. because my decisions impact a lot more people. Mm-hmm. And therefore, as you scale at, at, a, at a one level, at a smaller size, you need less accountability yeah. mm-hmm. and advice and wisdom probably. But as you scale, the, the consequences of your decisions and the direction of what you do has a huge impact yeah. on other people mm-hmm. and you need more yeah. accountability as it scales. And I think it's easy to look at a leader or someone that's that's doing something or like making decisions that you don't know all the details about and to like judge or to say things if you work for somebody or whatever. Um, and we talked about this the other day, actually, where like new things, like new responsibility brings out like new sides of you, I guess, because like when you have new pressure, there's new things like almost like muscles you didn't know existed, like things like that, that you have to like deal with. And so like me and Scott have talked about that the other day, we were talking about like how it used to be just the two of us. And now there's more people. And now it's like, that's, and I look at, like, I'll look at Scott sometimes and I'll be like, I don't really, you know, why do you do that? Or why do you like, you know, or whatever, just a thought. And then I'm like, you know what? Like there's so many new things happening, like new plates are spinning that are, you know what I mean? He's trying to hold up. And this goes for anybody that owns a company or runs an organization, but it's just like sometimes new pressures bring out new things that you didn't know that you had to either deal with or, or be or whatever the case may be. But I think it's interesting that, that sometimes those pressures can bring out new things in yep. you, you know? Agreed. Totally. Yeah, and it can be and you don't, And you definitely, it's interesting, depending on where you sit on the bus, <laughs> mm-hmm. you, you know, the larger the organization, but if you think of leadership as driving a vehicle, mm-hmm. all right? So you're driving a car, Scott, with, you're driving and you have how many people sitting in the car? four or five people, six people sitting in the car. Okay, you can't feel the pressure. Like Mindy thinks she understands what it's like to drive a car with five people in it, but until she's sitting in that seat, she can't know. With the storms that come and the speed Mm -hmm. and the other things that are happening. So that's hard as an employee. Because sometimes you think you know better. Sure. And as you scale, I mean, the way we talk about it, it's like, okay, I'm now driving a bus with a lot of seats in it. And the further people are in the back, yeah. they feel the bumps in the road and the d- what's going on. And it's hard. So I have to do a good job of telling them what's going on, making clear, you know, making sure, hey, we're about to, because they don't feel it. But I also have to care about the fact that I understand what it's like to sit way in the back. And I better be sensitive about that when I go around a turn. And my staff better know that I'm well-trained and I'm getting advice and I'm not just winging it when I start driving because they trust me and they put a lot of trust in what I'm doing. The employee though, it's like, you don't get it. You can't see out the windshield and you don't know what I feel and what it's like to be sitting here with the responsibility of this entire bus Mm -hmm. on my shoulders going through a snowstorm. Yeah. You think you know, but you don't. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's just a lot of weight. Like, there's not just your five employees, but they're their spouses as well. You're feeding, I mean, you're every feeding families. You're feeling like you're. I look at it. You're essentially responsible for twenty yeah. people for every. Yeah, I feel every have, time like, we hire somebody, I honestly have this image in my mind. Exactly what you're saying. I have this image in my mind of a bird and that little like. <laughs> like do I really? Like, do we really yeah. have enough to <clears throat> chew this up and spit it? Like, you know, like yeah. a bird feeding. Right. All the, I'm like, I, this is a big deal. Yeah, there's way more accountability than and just like. you don't, you know, from where I sit, you don't necessarily see out the windshield to what I can see and where we're going and what needs to happen in order for us to all get there. Mm-hmm. You can't see or feel that. So what's in, really important for me is to know what it feels like to be in the back of the bus and get up and walk back and see what everybody's like and how they're feeling because when somebody says to me, I've been sitting in the way back of the bus and it's hell back here mm. because we don't know what you're doing and what you're feeling. If I don't stop and listen to that, we're screwed. Yeah. Like they're going to hate being on the bus and yeah. the culture is going to get bad. So both the, 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 you know, the boss, the owner, have to, you have to understand what it's like to sit in the back seat. Yeah. 
and the person in the back seat has to go, I'm not sure I fully understand what it feels like to sit with the steering wheel in my hand either. Well, it's like when you're a pilot, like when you're, if you're in a big enough plane that there's like the five seats in the middle and it, if it were to get crazy bumpy with turbulence, but the pilot never came on and was like, just want to let you know we're going through the thing and it's going to be better. You're kind of like, can someone tell me what's going on? Yeah, yeah. But you can't expect them to just be comfortable. You may be comfortable because you're like, oh, this is normal. But it's they get on immediately when they know turbulence is coming. They are always, you're expecting that if yeah. you start to feel bumps, leadership, the pilot is going to hop on and be like, just want to let you all know what we're going through. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's, that's, I like that bus analogy. That's good. So clear communication yeah. is important, you'd say. And I was just thinking too with your car and vehicle analogy, because when you're in a smaller vehicle, it's very easy to talk. And it, like you can talk to the driver, we're in the back seat, there's five of us, we're all there, we can all communicate. As you move to a minivan, you're not going to really hear what's going on in that last row as you are to the driver. And when you get to the bus, there's no way unless you have good communication set up that from the driver to the person that's sitting in the back, you need to have good communication with good people that can communicate clearly what's going on. Because if there is a rough road coming up, you can say, brace yourself. But if you don't have people in the middle to tell the people in the way back to brace themselves, yeah. then they're going to get smashed. <laughs> no, that's like, a great point. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to have leaders, too. Like, as you grow, yeah, you know, there's, exactly. there's leaders that can communicate with that row or, you know. And so if you empower leaders within your organization, you don't have to probably communicate to every single person. You know, if you've empowered them to love and care for and communicate. And then you have to have, which we've talked about on podcasts before, like you have to ultimately have empathy in every position. Mm -hmm. I, as a boss, have to realize that you may be really mad because you don't understand certain things, but that's mm -hmm. just a reality of where you're at in the bus or where you're at. And the same has to be the opposite direction. Of right. there's, If we all know, ultimately, we can't know what everyone's feeling, mm -hmm. there has to be some level of grace, like you said, of understanding it makes no sense why that would be so important to you. But if it is, it is. I can't change yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So I need to figure out how to say, even though I don't get it, you also don't get certain things. Mm -hmm. We both have to find a middle ground of there are going to be certain things you don't get that don't make sense on all levels. And that's part of difficult. Right. That's just the difficulty of it. And certainly the bigger the vehicle. So move from the minivan to a bus to an airplane to a ship to the bigger a train full of different the cars more and expertise <laughs> yeah. that are needed. And it's so easy mm -hmm. to think you know how to drive better mm -hmm. when you're an employee. It's like right. you don't under you know you don't. You don't get it. Like, right? So when the guy comes on the airplane and says, We're hitting turbulence or we have to sit on the runway and wait, you want to scream from the back and go, yeah. Come on, just do this and just, do that. Just, just go. <laughs> you, you, you can't and so certainly when you're used to sitting in a seat and you're not driving, it's so easy to think. Backseat driver. Mm -hmm. I know how to do this better. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that the pilot mingles with the mingles with the passengers and mm -hmm. has good systems to ensure that the passengers know what's going on and are comfortable mm -hmm. and it's really good for employees to understand no i probably this is too complex i probably don't know mm -hmm. and understand but what's yeah. incumbent upon me as a leader no matter how big the company is is am i ensuring the values of the company and the people that are on the bus or on the plane with me know what's most important so we build a supervisor culture in our in our church, we have, you know, I have middle management, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how do I build a culture? So we have three words. Our supervisor culture is clear, caring coaches. If we can empower our supervisors to be clear, caring coaches, we believe everybody on the bus will be able to get yes. what they are needed to be able to be successful with the right accountability, the right love, and be flourish in their roles. But again, that's how do you build a supervisor culture? Yeah. Like, that's another level of scaling, yeah. Yeah. you know, that until you're there, you don't have the opportunity to do, but then you realize, oh, I need this. I need a supervisor culture. Yeah. yeah. And when you've never been there and then you suddenly are doing that, you can't expect it to be a smooth mm -hmm. you know, trip. Like Transition, when you yeah. first fly a plane, when you never flew a plane, it's not like you, you've never been there. Like yeah. in the same way that you've never been in the back of the bus, they've never driven the bus until they actually got in the bus. So it's like you're constantly having to just... I think, yeah, have that reality that you just don't necessarily, you're all in this together. Yeah, you're all it's, learning. You're all learning. Yeah, it's not easy. Well, this is good stuff. Really, really good yeah. stuff. 
I've really enjoyed this conversation. What about you guys? Oh, it's good. I love it. Are there any other points that anybody wants to? I guess my final question that I had was, is like, can you really win? Can you really scale if you don't genuinely love and care for people? Is that possible? Like, or what's your thought? Like, I, we already kind of talked about that, but like, I guess to define, define your win, I mean, what's the win? Is the say, win to make a the, lot of money? I was going to say Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs built an unbelievable company but was n- 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 notoriously known for something right. that no one liked working for. Yeah, I guess you can. Then, <laughs> but I mean, just the, I, I, it's like, yeah, I guess, I, but is it ideal? To scale, I guess, to become like... I uh, mean, I, I'm something. sure you can. I mean, clearly, like, I don't know. I mean, there's great armies and militaries around the world that have scaled and conquered and done incredible things sure. for the force of evil. Right. 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 So it's like, I don't know if caring about people and scaling are to have to be, you know, married together. Sure, sure. But, you know, I look at what I do and who I am as a person and I just go valuing people, right. caring for them along the way is so intrinsic to who I am. I can't imagine scaling without that. caring for people and treating people well along the road. And I, I just think you get the most out of people. Mm-hmm. And you accomplish the most lasting good in the world when you care. And that's not antithetical to leading well, right? So it's so easy to, again, go back to power. It's like, and that's not what I have. I don't have power. I have an opportunity to serve and mm-hmm. do good in the world. And for anybody, like if I wasn't doing this in church, I would be making a lot of money right? Yeah. doing it somewhere else. But I'd still want to do it f- and bring good about and treat people well. And I think that's what accomplishes the most lasting good in the world. So unfortunately, yeah, evil even scales. Yeah, yeah I think it comes down to whether or not you actually have people just that are enjoying. Mm. You could look at a massive, massive company and they could be a terrible leadership. Doesn't mean that the company isn't doing well on the books. Mm-hmm. Sure. But is anyone enjoying being there? Right, right. Is the hard part. Yeah. And then you look at the culture piece of it too. I mean, you can have really big businesses that are very successful, but I wonder what their culture exactly. looks yeah. like, like in the middle there? of it. Yep. You know, so I think it kind of depends on the culture that that you want to build. Well, thank you, Joe. Really appreciate you being here. This is some good stuff. I have uh, one last question. Okay, fine. Oh. It's, a, it's a really serious one. Uh oh. Dunkin' or Starbucks? Like, seriously? Are you going to even waste my time with that question? I'm not sure I'm even going to answer. I like, I like a coffee that bites me back. Okay. <laughs> wow. He likes, he likes Starbucks. So Starbucks. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not even going to use words. I just want to be bit. When All right. I drink my coffee. I want it to bite me. I want to bathe in lukewarm brown water. <laughs> Chocolate <Amen>. milk. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get an amen? Oh. <laughs> that was so great to have you. Thank you so much for, yeah, for taking time out of your day. We really appreciate your time. If people want to connect with you more, what's a good way to do it? Yeah, I mean, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and certainly love for you to visit our website, faithchurchlv.com. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for being here. Mm-hmm.